about business in the community's new musculoskeletal health in the workplace toolkit for employers. My name is Louise Aston and I'm Wellbeing Director here at Business in the Community. The toolkit is part of an interconnecting suite of four toolkits focusing on the two leading causes of days lost at work, musculoskeletal and mental health. The interactive suite was developed in association with Public Health England and expert content for the musculoskeletal toolkit was supported by the Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Alliance, known as ARMA, which is the umbrella body for the arthritis and musculoskeletal community in the UK. The toolkit consolidates best employer practice, takes a whole systems, whole person approach. It takes a really simple step-by-step -step approach that's relevant wherever you are on your journey as an employer. It's aimed at all employers, irrespective of size or sector. The toolkit deals with back, neck, muscle and joint pain at work and also together best information for support staff in the prevention, early identification, management and adaptation for people affected by MSK conditions. Now it's my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Anthony Wolfe, Chair of the Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Alliance who will be giving us an overview of the toolkit. Tony is a world expert on musculoskeletal health. He's involved in various high profile initiatives to raise awareness of the impact of MSK conditions, including education, prevention, treatment and research at a national, European and global level. He works with NHS England, Public Health England, and Department of Work and Pensions to ensure MSK health is in all health, social and employment policies. He's currently working with Public Health England and leading a program of work to reduce the impact that MSK conditions have on people's ability to work. We're very fortunate to have you here today, Tony, and in a moment when I've just gone through the questions, I will be passing over. So before we get started, I'd like to just go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's webinar. If you do experience any technical difficulties or can't see the slides for any reason, please email my colleague who's sitting beside me, Sana. Sana. Her email is sana, S-A-N-A, dot but, B-U-T-T, at B-I-T-C dot org dot U-K and we'll try and resolve the issue as soon as we can. During the webinar, we, we do encourage you to ask questions, and you can submit, submit questions to us by typing your questions into the questions tab on your control panel. You may send these at any time during the presentation, and we'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. We'll also be recording the webinar, and we'll circulate a link in a follow-up email to you um, so you can share it with your wider networks. So meanwhile, Anthony, really delighted to hand over to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Louise. And uh, I'd like to take you during the next 30 minutes through the toolkit, which is available th through the Business in the Community website. So this is an outline of it, and you will see there's quite a lot of content to support you in dealing with the enormous burden of musculoskeletal problems in the workplace. The toolkit, as you've heard, has been develop developed for employers with the content based on research evidence and also the experiences of what employers and employees find works. And this has included people with musculoskeletal problems and developed for Public Health England and Armour by business in the community. And we're very grateful for all the experts, employers and employees who've helped with this initiative. It's part of a bigger project, which you've heard about, which is under the auspices of the Global Alliance for Musculoskeletal Health and ARMA, which is around improving health in the workplace and reducing the impact of these conditions on people's lives. Musculoskeletal health is important because we all need to be able to move and be able to do things 
our dexterity, our mobility is essential to our everyday lives and also all kinds of work. And many people have problems with their MSK health, either arising independently of work or as a result of work, but in both cases having an impact on their ability to work. They're the greatest cause of disability in the UK and globally and affect people's ability to do their work because of limiting physical function and causing pain, stiffness, and actual limitation of movement of the joints and spine. These problems become more common as people get older, and with the aging population and aging workforce are going to have an even bigger impact unless we address this problem. Work that's unsafe or provides inadequate training is obviously a risk factor for injury and ongoing musculoskeletal problems, but there's also a lot of other conditions which can affect people's ability to work through causing a musculoskeletal problem. And work which is physically demanding or with high levels of stress can be some of the most challenging. The other thing to bear in mind is that musculoskeletal problems and mental health problems often go hand in hand together. When you put them together, they're the greatest cause of work loss, but there is an interrelationship in that chronic disabling pain and ongoing muscle problems can be associated with depression and stress. And if someone is depressed or under stress, then muscle problem is more likely to impact on their work. Just to give you some numbers to show the scale of the problem, muscle conditions accounted for 23% of all working days lost over 30 million in 2013. And if you look at people and their employment rates, only 60% of people with musculoskeletal problems are in work. So it's really a big cause of the employment gap and we have to do things to try and close that. Musculoskeletal conditions are a diverse range of problems affecting the bones, joints, muscles and tendons in them. The common factor, as I said, is that they're associated with pain and impaired physical function. Typically, they cover joint conditions, what's called arthritis, either osteoarthritis or inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis. There's bone conditions, such as osteoporosis and fragility fractures, back pain and neck pain, which are extremely common, as well as regional and widespread pain disorders. Then there's, there's injuries, such as sprains and strains, and also high high energy injuries such as associated with road traffic accidents. And then there are the less common genetic congenital and multi-system inflammatory diseases. As I said, a common feature is that they cause pain and limit people's ability to do what they need to do and want to do. The other feature is that many of them are recurrent or long-term. And I mentioned at the beginning, the importance of musculoskeletal health because it is integral to a life by giving us mobility and dexterity and virtually all forms of work require a good functioning musculoskeletal system. Also it enables us to be mobile and active and do our physical activity so it has a general benefit for our health overall but we have to make sure that we invest in it in all ages right through from childhood through to older ages. Injuries are a major risk factor and therefore obviously employers have to follow their legal duty to provide safe workplaces. But it's also very important that there's an investment in promoting health or just protecting people from injuries. It's not something which is only restricted to heavy jobs. People can put their muscle seatal system at risk or have problems with their work because of it even in desk jobs, and particularly nowadays with hot desking, where there's a lot of lifting and carrying and sitting in different workstations. So the toolkit, you understand the challenges specific to your workplace and come up with appropriate solutions. The aim is to go beyond just addressing the risk of injury, but look at promoting health and well-being and taking a proactive approach to preventing MSK issues occurring and preventing work loss if a problem has arisen. Another very important principle of the toolkit is about helping people help themselves, but 
for someone to help themselves, they have to be in an enabling environment, and therefore the workplace and the work processes have to support that person. We recognize also that a lot of employers are small and medium enterprises, and they need the advice of what they can do uh, if they don't have within house a lot of some of the occupational health facilities that other large employers do have. So the toolkit has three components. Firstly, why must digital health is important to you as an employer and to your business? Secondly, what can be done to prevent these problems and also to reduce work loss? And thirdly, how it can actually be achieved? And we give a step-by-step -step approach. First thing is, why should anything be done about it? Why is it important to you? And the business case is compelling. You've just seen the numbers of the amount of work loss, and it's estimated that sickness absence costs £522 per case, with MSK problems being the prime contributor. And as I mentioned, the risks for poor muscles here are present in all types of business. It's not just something related to heavy manual occupations. These problems are extremely common, so even if you do not have tasks which are likely to cause a problem, it's very likely that people will be coming to work with these problems which have arisen outside, because these conditions affect one in eight working age adults. And it's not something which is just for older people. There are many younger people who run into problems such as back pain or neck pain. The cost is through sick pay, lost productivity, loss of key skills, retraining costs and legal costs. And there are opportunities because these conditions can be effectively prevented and managed. It's not an inevitable problem, and litigation can be avoided by good practice. There's also a clear moral case to invest in the health of one's workers and look after people, which is good for recruitment and retention. It's recognized now by all of us that work has a positive impact on health and well-being, so we really need to enable people to do what they want to do and need to do. And we know that problems such as neck, back and muscle and joint conditions are common causes of people being off work and unable to do these tasks. There are many ways that an employer can help, and we need to go through those with you. We're following the business in the community's work well model, which supports employers to take a whole systems, whole person approach to well-being focusing on better physical and psychological health, better work, better relationships, better specialist support, and resulting in working well. The first step for you as an organization is to be prepared. And the first part of that preparation is actually recognizing the importance of muscle seasonal health in your workplace and for your employees and for you to know, have you actually measured the extent and nature of any MSK problems or risks to muscle seasonal health in your workplace? The impact they can have on employees is at different levels. There's the classic worse disability with people retiring early or people being absent from work through sick leave, but muscle seasonal conditions also have a great impact on what's called presenteeism. That means being in work, but with difficulty and reduced productivity. So there's a lot to gain from recognizing those problems and then developing a plan to deal with it. It's also very important to recognize the link between muscle seasonal health and mental health. We know that employees with muscle seasonal problems are at high risk of stress, anxiety, and depression. That mental health also has an impact on a person's ability to deal with a muscle seasonal problem. That employees need to understand and recognize these problems may require support for their mental health. People are often very sensitive that if we start talking about mental health when they present with pain, that we're not believing in them, but they have to recognize that there is a very close interaction and both need to be managed. So the first step though is to ensure that health and well-being are embedded in the culture and that these things 
are brought up to the forefront in open conversations and then dealt with. Open communication is one of the key steps which has to be achieved. If you have an open positive culture, then it will bring out the problems, bring out the solutions, and enable it to be implemented to reduce work loss. So the key thing is, how do you actually start that conversation? And there are challenges to open conversations because there's some stigma for people to talk about their musculoskeletal problem. A young person does not want to say that they have a arthritis and that they can't do something. Uh, actually, to try and ignore it. So we have to work out how to have those conversations and not for the person to feel threatened by the admission of their difficulties that they have with their job. So there are some quick wins which are detailed in the toolkit of how you can start things going, such as a well-being survey to help identify these sorts of problems and encourage people to come up with possible solutions uh, and getting some nominated person to take some leadership in this role. We also give a checklist for you to know where you stand in terms of being prepared. The next step is what you can actually do about the problems uh, that you identify. And there's three levels, prevention, early intervention, and rehabilitation. And the aim is to encourage a proactive approach to reducing the risks that may result in muscle disease problems, but also helping employ problems to enable them to have full working lives. So it's about taking preventative action, encouraging early intervention for any muscle seizure problem, and accommodating effective rehabilitation and return to work plans. First thing is to understand the needs within your organization, within your workforce. What are the characteristics of the work, their physical and mental demands? What are the characteristics of the workforce, their age spectrum? experience, gender, fitness, mixture of skills, which may be risk factors, <clears throat> and also what problems are they getting? What, what shows up in your sickness records? Do you have frequent problems from back pain and neck pain, which are causing significant loss of work? Then when you know that, you can start developing a plan. <clears throat> Prevention is very important around reducing the risks, preventing accidents and injuries, following the rules and regulations which have been developed to minimize known risks in the workplace. And that's extremely important. But also there needs to be softer things such as increased physical activity, encouraging stopping smoking, reducing alcohol consumption, and reducing stress. All these will help. And very importantly, open discussions with employees about how they can be helped to improve their lifestyle and reduce their general risks. When one's looking at risks in the workplace, it really is making sure that there's a good match between the employee's capabilities and the job demands, that they're using the right sort of equipment and are trained to use it and are following the rules and not calling themselves undue risks. And therefore they have to have a high value on health and safety and everyone obviously has to understand the law. Early identification of physical capability problems is very important, and this is where there's always a problem about getting people to talk about it. Uh, in a survey done by Arthritis Research UK last year, 40% of people did not feel confident discussing their workplace health with their employer. And a third of people with a long-term condition felt that their, their colleagues didn't understand the impact of their condition. So people feel very isolated and alone and suffering in silence, as we say. And we have to try and encourage those open conversations to highlight these issues, otherwise you can't find the solutions. When someone does get a problem, then the sooner it's managed, the better the outcome is going to be. So therefore, again, emphasizing the importance of getting people to speak up if they have a difficulty. We know that if someone's been off work for a long time with back pain, the chances of coming back is very low. 
So you really have to identify the problem early and intervene as quickly as possible. Those interventions can often be quite simple, such as reasonable adjustments at work, uh, which come out about from just an open conversation about how you can help them get around their difficulties. It may need appropriate healthcare management of their muscle seizure problem and make sure that is accessible rapidly with a focus on restoring people's function so they can come back to work. And any psychological barriers do need to be identified and dealt with at a very early stage. When someone gets a physical problem, they naturally get very worried about what this will mean in the long term in their ability to continue with their work because the reputation of these conditions is that they will have an impact and possibly a long-term impact. The fit note is a very important document to try and identify how these problems can be got around. But the most important thing is the conversation around the fit note. Then simple adjustments can be made which, as I said, can really help in many cases. Because we know that it's good to get people back into work, providing it is the right sort of work. Those adjustments need to come out of discussions because the employee do not want to keep saying what they can't do. They would much prefer having a conversation about how they can get around their difficulties and continue with their work. The other thing, thing to remember is that these conditions not only affect people through their daily routine, uh, so affect people at work, but also throughout their day. So they need to work around that as well. So they have a lot of anxieties upon them. Rehabilitation is very important. And with that, the focus has to be on how to get someone back to work. So for example, if someone develops back pain, it's not just about treating their back pain, but it's how to help them manage their back pain and get on back doing the tasks that they want to do, either their work, but also their leisure activities, which are equally important to many people. How do we actually really help people? Self-management is a very important aspect of helping people. Although many of these conditions settle down after a while, either with treatment or spontaneously, and do not have a long-term impact, quite a few of them are long-term. If someone gets a bad back, there's always that unknown as to when is it going to get better? Is it going to get better? So helping someone deal with that problem themselves and work around it is extremely important. And therefore, self-management has a major place to play. People sometimes have to accept that they will need to go to work despite having a bad back because overall it won't make it worse and in absolute terms it will be better for them. So we have to try and make sure that people get that right sort of support and there are many organizations who provide information for people as to how they can manage their problems and there are some self-management courses available in some parts of the country. Obviously, it's important that the law is understood and implemented. So there are some things which can be done which will specifically help people. Uh, there's obviously the safety things, but as you know, within the law, an important thing is the entitlement to resources. And I think that's a very important tool we have to help people stay in work. The toolkit does signpost you to some of these resources which can help support employees who have these problems. Also, we give a checklist to make sure that you are doing what can be done to help people manage acetyl problems. The third component is making sure that there's the appropriate knowledge. This requires training. Managers need to be aware of and understand health and well-being, the importance of muscle seal health, understand the risk factors, particularly those in their workplace, be aware of their health and safety responsibilities, but importantly know how to support employers and how to have those conversations. 
the need to understand how to look after their own muscle seat of health, the risk factors, the importance of using the right equipment and the right uh, techniques to minimize any risks, and to know how to help themselves if they do get a problem. There has to be an open understanding of the links between muscle seat health and mental health with good communication. And there needs to be materials available for people and many of these are accessible through the web and again the toolkit gives links to them. Line managers have a very important role to play. They will be the one giving the most direct support to the employee who has a problem. They need to ensure there's an optimum match between the employee's capabilities and job demands, equip the employees with necessary skills to cope with the demands of their job through training and other support, and encourage employees to place a high value on health and safety. But very importantly, they must be prepared to listen and those conversations with the employees they're responsible for and act on the problem they have to find solutions. Because what we want to do is make sure that staff can perform their work in a safe and sustainable way, minimizing risk to their health. They need to be trained and follow that training. So although line managers are important, the employees being trained and following that training and looking after their own health is equally important. Communication is key and people do find it often difficult to have conversations. Employees do not always know who they should talk to, uh, do not know always how to bring up a conversation which doesn't sound as though they're not capable of doing their work and obviously then become nervous about having that discussion. So it really does require line managers to be approachable and able to offer support and be proactive in what they can do and not just reactive. Again, there's a checklist in the toolkit highlighting what is important within knowledge and training. Those are the basics which hopefully can be achieved by all employers, small, medium, and large. But then there's always the possibility of going further. And that's about becoming an ambassador of muscle procedural health as a business. There are several ways you can do this. One is through your supply chain, encouraging and supporting your supply chain to promote muscle procedural health and reduce the impact muscle procedural problems have on work. One can also work through business organizations such as BITC is doing uh, with this webinar. And importantly, you can tell stories because we need to know how people have dealt with this problem successfully so that others can follow. We need good examples of best practice, either in terms of health promotion, early intervention, or rehabilitation and return to work that has helped so that we can spread those stories and if you have good examples, please inform us. The toolkit aims to support you through resources and we give plenty of examples of data, what's available in the NHS, legislation and there's other things including what is available from the muscle seat community. There's a lot of information out there to help people deal with their problems and have better knowledge of their problems. And we encourage you to use them and encourage your employees to use them as well. Finally, the toolkit gives case studies because it's always easier to see how others have done it rather than just going through a recipe. And finally, there's a checklist which goes through the different steps to see whether you've actually managed to develop an effective program to reduce these problems. I'd like to thank the various organizations, individuals who've helped with developing this toolkit, who are listed here, 
and highlight that this toolkit is available through BITC, but as Louise said at the beginning, it's part of a suite of toolkits covering other major causes of work loss. And finally, as I mentioned, this toolkit is part of a larger project around reducing the impact of musculoskeletal health on work. And if you'd like to know more about that or find out more about how you can reduce it, the impact of musculoskeletal problems in your workplace, please contact myself and we can see how we can work together to achieve this. Thank you. That's great, Tony. Thank you very much. Is um, We've now got an opportunity for to take some questions. Um, really like to start with, what would you recommend as a first step for all employers to take in terms of kind of addressing musculoskeletal health? To get things started, people have to recognize that there is a problem. So I think the first thing is actually to understand your workplace, to know what sort of work loss you have, whether you, you know there's significant work loss, what are the reasons for it, uh, to see if there's any pattern, look at the tasks which are involved uh, in your workplace as to the risks they might impose on the musculoskeletal system, the demands they impose on the musculoskeletal system, and also the workforce itself, the age spectrum, what sort of problem they'll have. Because I think once you understand that you have a problem, then there's a lot of recommendations of what you can do about it. I think it's one of the biggest challenges getting people to start off. Okay, that's great. That also Is implies for the employees as well, that they have to recognize that they have to look after their health and what they need to do as well. Okay, that's great. It's Tony, we've a number of people have actually submitted questions to us, and please keep the questions um, because we've got plenty of time to answer them. Um, so the first question is from Camel Bant, is how do we measure the prevalence of MSK and how does this help us? So there's various questionnaires to measure the prevalence of MSK and we're actually, as part of our project, we are developing uh, one to be more specific around MSK problems and the risk factors for it. But yes, there are survey tools you can use, and if you contact us, we can direct you towards them, which look at the prevalence of MSK problems, but also the impact that they have on people's ability to do their work. Okay. It's Camel also has in his question, is that the biggest issue that he has is with people's chairs, and finding a chair to suit someone can be very difficult. Um, in terms of simple workstation assessments, don't always work. Is any work being done on ergonomics? I think what we're finding with the work we're doing is there's an enormous opportunity for better ergonomics for everyday equipment. At the moment, because we tend to focus on people when they've got a problem, we don't do enough about preventing those problems. So many people only get a well-designed chair once they've got back pain. And really we need to try and improve ergonomics throughout. Uh, and I think that's through procurement as well. So we do need to try and work out ways of improving the ergonomic design of a lot of equipment. And then through procurement, make sure that, that becomes the norm. It's a bit like with uh, a mouse for the computer. Uh, with doing all these presentations, I've developed some forearm discomfort and started looking for an ergonomic mouse. And it shouldn't be that so many of them are actually badly designed in the first place. So we need some ergonomic designs. OK. Um, we've also got a specific question about, can you recommend any useful resources with tips for back pain and driving? Uh, I think there are some out there, and if you communicate with me, we will try and signpost you to them. Okay, great. And another one, without putting you on the spot, is how would you rate the toolkits that are available, such as Art Ruler? I've never heard of that. 
Um, have you heard of it, Tony? No, I haven't, no. Okay. Um, so I think one thing I would say is a lot of the materials we looked at in developing this toolkit have been previously very much focused on risk and health protection. And we've tried to take a more broad integrated approach looking at not only health protection, but also health promotion and health management. Um, <laughs> we've also been asked the question is um, whether or not there's going to be a tailored version of the toolkit for Scotland. Um, do you want me to answer that or do you, Tony? Uh, I think the thing to do would to be to make sure that we have links into any resources which are more specific to Scotland. The general content is uh, fairly non-denominational and is applicable in any country, but when it comes to the specific resources, that is probably where there may be some differences. So if you do know any specific resources, then I'm sure we can find ways of making sure there's access to them. Okay. Um, another good question. Um, have you noticed that employers are starting to recognize the size and importance of the problem of poor MSK health in the workforce? If not, what more can be done? I, th I think a lot of people are recognizing the problem because it is so large that it can't be missed uh, in terms of the work loss in most places. So I think we are beginning to get there. It's a matter of then what do I do about it and making it not sound too burdensome for action and also to make sure the action isn't only focused on you know, we do everything we need to do in terms of health and safety uh, but actually as I said earlier the more proactive approach around really encouraging people and getting them to do more physical activity enabling them to have mini breaks and things like that and really embedding it into work practices it's it's really great, Tony. A lot of people have come back answering other people's questions. And actually what I'd like to suggest is when we send out the kind of follow-up email in terms of the recording of this webinar with the link to the toolkit, um, is, Sana, is we actually include an invitation to people to join our Wellbeing at Work Business in the Community LinkedIn group. So you can carry, everyone who's on this webinar can carry on the conversation. I um, think that's very important uh, that we do try and create a community of people who are interested in this area so we can share and learn from each other and look at innovative ways of dealing with these problems. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, another question. Tony, would you recommend the MSK H? as a health check for employees? So I think it's important that we do have a way of assessing whether people do have MSK problems which impact on their lives and the MSK HQ is a very good tool for that. In addition to that we also need to know something about what the person is doing and what help they're getting with their problems and that's why we're in the process of developing something which can add on to the MSK HQ, slightly broader look at the impact so that solutions can be found. But it is a good way of measuring the impact these conditions have. Okay, great. Um, so we've got a lot of comments and a lot of kind of useful suggestions that we will certainly try and incorporate into the toolkit. But Tony, is from your experience which is absolutely vast we you talked about the kind of first step employers should take kind of equally what are the kind of biggest mistakes that you see employers make I think the most important thing is to be prepared to offer some flexibility certainly the people with more long long-term problems where they are limited in what they can do. They can only perhaps 
be 80% efficient uh, time for treatment, certain healthcare interventions, uh, they will get fatigue and it's having some flexibility, recognizing more what you want them to deliver and letting them have a bit more flexibility in terms of how they deliver it. Now that obviously can be difficult in some workplaces, but I think that's the thing we've got to be able to work around because we're going to increasingly find with an aging workforce that people cannot do the same jobs 100% of the time throughout their whole careers. So we're going to have to work out how we introduce a degree of flexibility. And I think when we're talking to people with these problems, that's what they want. The other group is someone who first develops a problem, and that's where we need to get them to speak up quickly so they can get intervention done quickly. Uh, and there is quite a lot of work now about early intervention clinics for muscle seizure problems, making a difference in terms of work loss. Okay. The thing that I was really struck by, Tony, was around of MSK and dysclosure. Yep. In terms of dysclosure, all the same issues as with mental health. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on that, please? Yeah, so it's, I mean, as a clinician, as a clinician, we know that people do not necessarily like talking about these problems. People don't like to talk about what they can't do. And when we're trying to help people manage a mycetal problem, we almost encourage them to ignore it and get on with it, which then makes it difficult for them to have those conversations. Also, people in pain do not necessarily look sick. Uh, so they do, and, and also quite often they are young. So they have a problem in getting it across that they are having difficulties. So it's, it is a problem and it's not always, people aren't always aware of it. And I know when uh, Louise, you and I had a conversation about it before, you were surprised and many people are surprised. In fact, it has, I was just hearing today about a large survey of people with uh, muscle problems. And again, it highlighted that Particularly younger people found it really difficult to talk about these problems and having have those discussions and don't want to talk about it. So it is a challenge and that's why one has to work out a way of getting around it. I think people won't necessarily want to say what condition they have. I don't think they should have to say what condition they have, but they should be able to say, I find it difficult to stand up for a long period of time or I find it difficult to hold something for a long period of time without actually going into the details of why, and then that be worked around. Uh, for example, yeah. uh, I see people who work in shops, and as they get older, they find it hard to stand there all day long, uh, looking perfect and elegant and everything as they expect, and not allowed to sit down. And it wouldn't be unreasonable for them to be able to just perch on occasions to take some stress off their joints. So we need to work out how to help people have those conversations about what they can't do, finding a simple solution. And also it needs trust that if an employee says, I can't stand for a long period of time, that's believed and a solution is found. Okay, thanks. And then finally, Tony, is can you elaborate a little bit more on what we mean by taking a kind of whole person, whole systems approach to MSK? Yes, so I'm, I'm, my background is as a rheumatologist, so I'm used to dealing with people who have muscle seat problems and then say that they can't work. And coming into this area, previously there's been a predominance in the area of health protection, and we know that despite all the teaching classes, we mandatory training we do about how to lift and everything, back pain still has an enormous impact. So a single approach around health and safety hasn't worked. We also know that people spend a lot of their lives in the workplace, so it's an ideal place for them to generally improve their health uh, through health and well-being programs. And then we also know that people run into health problems which may impact on their work. So we need to take an approach which brings all that together and looks at the person and looks at what are the barriers to them being able to work and how can we get rid of those barriers, be it by improving their workplace, improving their work, improving their general health, 
and managing their specific mastocetal problem. It's really looking at the person and how to enable them to do what they want to do and need to do. Okay, that's great. And Tony, is there anything else that you'd like to add to your excellent presentation? Well, as I said, I'd like to highlight this is ongoing work, so I would encourage people to join the LinkedIn group. And also, we'd be very pleased for you to say whether you're happy to be contacted, because we are wanting to work with employers to learn more about how we can assess these problems and find solutions and then implement those solutions. Okay, that's great. Tony, thank you so much. And um, yeah, thank you for sharing your expertise. And as I said at the beginning, we will we have recorded this webinar. Is my colleague Sana will be sending out a link to the toolkit suite and an individual link to the musculoskeletal um, toolkit. If you just Google business in the community MSK toolkit for employers, you'll find it freely available. Um, well, we'd also very much appreciate it if you could promote the toolkit suite to your own networks. Um, there's an excellent opportunity coming up with Responsible Business Week, which is from the 24th to 28th of April. And if you look on Business in the Community's website, you'll see it's a great kind of vehicle to piggyback onto. Or alternatively, we've got Mental Health Awareness Week coming up on the 8th of May. And obviously, as Tony talked about, it says uh, mental health and MSK go hand in hand. Um, along in the email is Sana will be sending the link to join our LinkedIn group. So we'd like to continue the conversation and welcome feedback on the toolkit. Um, so thank you all very much for listening and um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you. Thank you.